<clears throat> We're back. What have we got here? Rang is here. This this is someone. Oh, Salah's here. Tanner's here. Nice to see you all. Jade is here. All right. I guess we should crack straight into it. Uh, can we all see the PowerPoint here? Cool. <laughs> all right, last one for the week. Let's go. Any minute now. <coughs> okay, three phase transformers. All right. So, a three phase transformer is uh like a single trace phase transformer except it has three phases it's going to uh have three primaries and three secondaries so each phase will have its own uh winding but other than that it more or less follows the same rules as a single phase transformer there's nothing super complicated about this uh construction Transformer cores are made of materials that easily conduct magnetic flux with minimum losses. The material most commonly used is silicon steel, which has been found to have the least losses and which is the most suitable for transformer construction. The vertical portions of the laminated iron core are called limbs. The top and bottom portions are called yokes. Here we are here. So I have uh, three limbs and the yoke at each end. And wound over the top of each of my limbs, I have uh, windings. And it looks like here I've got the primary winding. You can sort of see that at the top of the bottom. One, two, three primary windings. One, two, three secondary windings wound over the top. So that's a shell transformer. This is a core transformer. which if I'm honest, I'm struggling to see much of a difference there. Oh, I see. The, uh, the shell type transformer has got the um, additional limbs on each end, so five limbs total, whereas this one just has the, the, just the three. Yeah, there we go. So there's our, our core type and Shell type. Obviously, you see that we can see there that the uh, the uh, three phase transformers have the three three windings, uh, which will be six windings, of course. So bear in mind that uh, there will be a primary and a secondary for each each phase. uh what do we reckon here teams is going to be a core or a shell transformer who 
look back at the picture here. We'll look at this one here. Have we got a core or a shell? Core, I agree. That looks like a core to me. Obviously, it looks like a slightly different arrangement. The three phases are arranged, or the, the core is created with the 120 degrees between each of the limbs, uh, which is not going to affect it electrically, I presume. That's just, uh, might be just for the purpose of the drawing. So this is our, our core arrangement showing each of the three uh, windings here. So we have our um, primary A, primary B, primary C, secondary A, secondary B, and secondary C. And this is the shell type arrangement with the uh, primary and secondary wound together on each limb. So it's primary a, secondary A, primary B, secondary B, primary C, secondary C. Also note on here the uh, direction of flow of magnetic flux that's caused by each of these coils. That's side by side winding placement. Windings placed in this way provide the best insulation between primary and secondary windings. And so we have our tra transformer core there, the primary winding at the top, secondary winding at the bottom. They provide the best insulation because the windings are physically separate. If we wind them together on top of each or on top of each other, uh, they're going to um, need better insulation, right? Because the uh, touch. A sandwich winding placement. This method is used where magnetic leakage must be kept to a minimum. This method is used as in large distribution transformers. So each of these are not separate windings, they're parts of the same winding. So that's the we've got the primary and primary here, secondary here secondary here so they're winding with each other so that gives us the best uh magnetic interchange between the coils if you like because they're wound together uh, but obviously that won't have the uh, same advantages of insulation as the previous one this one that our insulation is at a bit more risk because all the uh, coils are going to be physically touching each other if they're not properly insulated uh concentric winding so that's physically with one wound and then the other one wound over the top of it you would see that the dark shade there is the primary winding close to the limb and then the lighter shade secondary winding over the top of it uh so again magnetically this is an advantage because they're uh, wound one on top of the other okay winding arrangements uh this is going to be the tricky the tricky bit of this module star and delta so we we haven't really talked about this before um so we'll do our best to get through it Let's see if we can figure this out star and delta winding connection methods show all possible configurations for primary and secondary windings star is where one end of each winding is connected to a common point Delta is where the windings are connected in series with each other. Within each of these connection methods, there are line and phase relations. This is a picture of a star connected. Uh, well, in this case, I guess secondary. A little bit confusing. Uh, you guys can see my um, mouse cursor on this one, eh? Yeah, okay. Just checking, otherwise I'm going to be waving my mouse around and you guys won't know what I'm talking about. So we have these three lines set 120 degrees apart, here and here. They represent my phases, or uh, a, in this case a phase is another way of saying the coil of the, uh, of the transformer. So if my th three transformer coils, one, two, three. 
No, the three are connected together in the center, which means I'm going to take my output uh, lines. So those are the uh, lines going out to my load or whatever it is. I'm going to take those from the other end, the other end of uh, each of my phases. So one end of each of the phases is connected together. The other end is my output supply. So the, there, there is a, uh, an, a bit of an oddball relationship between lines and phase voltage here. So if you look at, uh, if you see everywhere it says EL, one here, one here. So that's E, e here is used to represent voltage. So we've got a voltage here that's between the output of line one and line two, right? So there's my phase one, so that's line one. Phase two, that's line two. So in a normal um, electrical system like we would see, the voltage between the two lines, if I measured it here, E line, or here, E line, so that's from phase one, or line one to line three. Uh, well, you tell me, how many, how many volts am I likely to measure uh, my line voltage in the New Zealand system? line to line anyone can answer that what's my line voltage three phase line voltage come on someone To do. Nice try. 400. Thank you, Nathan. I, is, I feel like it was 50 50, 230 or 400. So, in this three phase arrangement here, I'm going to get 400 volts between my lines. Now, you notice that I have this additional uh, conductor here. That's my neutral. So, I can put the neutral to the center point of the star and it's going to give me my zero volt reference. Now again, if I, uh, if this is a regular New Zealand system and I measure the voltage between one of the lines and the neutral, so that's that one coming out of there, <coughs> what voltage am I likely to see? Go Ray. You got this one. Two thirty, nice job. And this is, uh, <laughs> woo. This is, uh, this is real. So, so if I've got two hundred thirty volts line to line, but two hundred thirty, uh, sorry, four hundred volts line to line, two hundred thirty line to neutral. That means that if I measure between this point here, it's where my neutral is connected, and this point here where one of my lines is connected, so the voltage across that coil, this this here is representing the coil in our transformer. That means I've got 230 volts across that coil. But if I measure from the end of this coil to the end of this coil, that's my line voltage, right? That's 400. So that means if I've got measuring those two coils together from this point down to this point i get 400. so that should confuse you a little bit because logic tells me or at least uh my rudimentary knowledge of electricity tells me that if i put those two phases in series like they are then uh, those two voltages should add together so i should if i measure 230 across one of those coils then two of them together i should get uh 460 but i i obviously don't so the relationship between the uh line and phase voltages in this instance when we say a phase voltage it's the voltage across one of those coils or which i would see when i measure uh, line to neutral and then line voltage is line to line so that's two coils the relationship between them is uh, square root of three. 
And if you want to test that, you could take out your calculator and multiply 230 by the square root of 3. Just like that, 230 times the square root of 3 equals 398.37 or pretty close to two uh, pretty close to 400 volts um, why magic it's about, that's our that's our relationship between line and uh, it's relationship between line and phase voltages that's why we get 230 volts 230 volts to neutral and 400 volts between lines on a three phase system because all of our transformers, all of the output transformers, the secondaries rather of our transformers that are supplying houses or buildings in New Zealand will always be a star connected three phase transformer. <coughs> so there we go. Now, if we look at the uh, delta and the delta, we don't have one end of each of those coils connected together. We have the start of each coil connected to the end of each coil. So. Again, each of these lines here represents a coil in our transformer. So I have uh, the start there, finish there, the finish of that one is connected to the start of the next one, and so on and so on. So they're connected all around in series. So in this one here, my line voltage from phase to phase, or line one to line two, will actually be the same as the phase voltage across any one of those coils. So the, uh, the relationship between uh, phase voltage and line voltage in a delta system is one to one. Uh, there's one big downside of using a delta wound or delta connected transformer secondary. Can anyone spot that? It's also the reason why we, we solely use star, star connected secondaries to output voltage to homes, buildings, so forth. Anyone have an idea? There's nowhere on the delta connection for me to put a neutral. There is no zero point in the system here. Everywhere I could connect something, which are the corners of those three triangles, will be uh, will be live. So because there's no neutral, this is no good to me to output um, voltage for any practical purpose, because uh, we need a neutral in all of our buildings. Uh, we do use delta it is used uh, you might have a transformer for a specialist purpose where you actually want that delta connection um, and you don't need a neutral or uh, inside motors so a three-phase motor can be star or delta connected as well so we do use delta connected motors but for for in new zealand for our power transformers that are transmitting power to through our um Through our transmission system, uh, the secondaries are always going to be star connected because we want that neutral. Uh, here's a picture of what a, uh, oh, is a star star transformer. So that means that we've got a star connected primary and a star connected secondary. It's the most economical connection for a small output high voltage transformer. However, it is rarely used due to balancing and harmonic issues. <laughs> So uh, yeah, we, when we when we uh, represent star, we generally use like this little picture on the right hand side there, the three pointed star. If you show that to any electrician, they'll say that's a three phase star connection. Uh, but this is what it what it would look like, right? So we have my three separate coils, and one end of each of those coils is connected together. That's the right hand end on these ones, and then the three lines are running out of there. And then same on the secondary side. So this is star on one side, star on the other. Now, obviously, if we can have star star, then presumably we could have any other mix of star and delta. And here we have 
a delta delta connection it's the most economical for a high current low voltage transformer uh and here we have uh the windings are connected end to end so one through to the next through to the next out of the end of the last one back to the start of the first one so it's delta on one side delta on the secondary as well <coughs> This is a delta star transformer, so uh, that means we have delta on the primary and star, a star connection on the secondary. As it says here, the secondary neutral may be earthed or it may be used to fire a, a four wire supply. So this is most likely what we would have uh, to supply uh, our transmission system. We we want that neutral on the output side, so the secondary has to be star because we need that neutral connection, which will be connected along this line here, right? So that's the uh, the end of each winding that's connected together, so I can keep my neutral anywhere on there. But on the primary side, I, I don't need that neutral because uh, it's just going to be three phases coming in from the um, power station. And as it said on the star star, transformers it's really used because of uh, other issues with balancing and so forth so if you look at uh, a power uh, power lines hung in the air from power poles you only ever see three conductors we don't we don't run a neutral um, so the three phases there will go down to a delta connected primary with a star connected secondary on the output side to give us our neutral And this one's the opposite. This is a star connection on the primary side, delta on the secondary. Uh, the primary neutral is maintained at a stable condition by the secondary delta. Yeah, so there's no neutral on the, del on the delta side, which means that the currents must be balanced. So that will help to balance the neutral current on the other side, but it's not something we're particularly worried about. They transform a cooling. Uh, we talked about transformer cooling uh, just an hour ago in our last topic. Oh, why are they called star and delta? Great question. Uh, see the little pictures here? That The top one is called star because it kind of looks like a star. It's a three-pointed star. And the bottom one is delta because anyone want to have a guess? It's really obvious. No. Right. Okay, the Greek letter delta is a triangle. That is the symbol for what's. Well, it looks like the Greek letter delta. So they're called star and delta for the dumbest, most uncreative reasons, and that when we draw them, that's what they look like. One looks like a star, one looks like a symbol for the Greek letter delta. Good question, should answer. Unfortunately, I wish it was something exciting. I can make something up. They're named after John Starr and Dave Delta, who uh, both discovered those two competing systems and killed each other in a duel in 1846 over uh, whose one was better. And then, of course, afterwards, uh, both of those different systems serve their own purposes. Uh, so we now coexist with Starr and Delta and uh, uh, happily together, even though uh, our mates John Starr and Dave Delta killed each other. There you go. That's a better story. And then I guess one of them electrocuted an elephant, probably. Or a hippopotamus. Dave Dave Delta, that's what the duel was about, because Dave Delta um, electrocuted a hippopotamus using a star system, and then John Starr got quite, quite fired up about it. So shot each other in the duel. Sad story. All right, transformer calling. One day somebody might watch this video back and wonder what on earth I'm talking about. Just so we're clear, I made that up. The real reason is because one looks like a star and one's the Greek letter for um, Delta. Uh, oh, and there was a little callback in that made up answer uh, to the previous video in which we talked about um, Thomas Edison electrocuting an elephant to discredit uh, Nikolai Tesla. And if you're watching this in the future and wonder what on earth that is about, that's a real thing that happened. Uh, go back to the previous video on single trace phase transformers and um, we can see that.
Right. Um, and as Rangi Mari is rightly pointing out, I'm talking rubbish, so let's get back to it. So our last topic for the week, so I'll try my best to stay on task. So after this, I'm going to go uh, to sleep probably for the rest of the week. Uh, all right, so we know from our last one that we're going to have heat produced in the transformer uh, due to those losses, iron losses, copper losses. The iron losses being uh, the eddy currents that are happening inside the core that, that we, we can't do much about. We split the core up into those laminated sections rather than one big iron core um, to, to minimize the amount of current that can flow. Uh, but other than that, we just have to suck it up. Now, our copper losses are due to the resistance of the coil, the pure copper resistance of the coil multiplied by uh, the current that's flowing. So the more current I draw, the greater those copper losses are going to be because it's, it's a heating effect of just putting current through copper, right? To prevent undue temperature rise, the heat is removed by cooling. This is obviously going to uh, improve the maximum capacity of our transformer. As we said earlier, the greater the current flowing through the transformer, the more heat that will be produced. And just like we've talked about on uh, a number of occasions, with any copper cable or any cable made of anything, any cable, the the limiting factor on how much current it can uh, safely transmit is the heat that's produced and the heat that can be dissipated. Uh, because heat is the enemy of our of our conductor. Eventually, it will get hot enough that it will burn out that conductor. So, and so a transformer is, is the same. It's no different. The more current I punch through that transformer, the greater the copper losses will be, the greater the heat will be that is generated, and therefore, eventually, there will be so much heat that the transformer will destroy itself, or at least the conductors inside the coil will melt. So we can uh, right, rightfully say then that uh, the power handling capacity of a transformer is limited by the heat that it can dissipate, which is true for a cable as well, right? So, um, you know, when we've done cable selection and we looked at those different mounting or installation situations, like buried direct in the ground or um, in the air or on a wall, in thermal insulation, inside a conduit, and they have different ratings for all those different things. It's just because of the heat dissipation. You know, we've talked about that. But it follows logically then that if I were able to somehow manually cool the cable in one of those situations, then I guess I would be able to uprate the current carrying capacity of that cable uh, because it's only heat that's going to um, destroy it. So there's no, there's no specific number of current that's going to destroy a cable. That's the heat that destroys the cable. So if I could remove the heat another way, then the cable could carry, I mean, if I could remove infinite amount of heat from the cable, then in theory, any size cable could carry any amount of current. It's just the heat that's a problem. Now, we don't tend to obviously um, cool cables. It seems rather pointless. Uh, in most cases, it'd be far more economical and more practical for me to just use a bigger cable uh, but in the case of a transformer, it's uh, it's fixed in position. It's there to do a certain job. Um, uh, there is some economy in there. Some economy there in uh, cooling, cooling the transformer in order to increase its capacity uh, than just building a bigger transformer. Incidentally, just going to go back to the first sentence of this before we move on. Heat is produced in a transformer by the eddy current and hysteresis loss in the core. The eddy current and hysteresis loss, we actually use that to our advantage. And we may have talked about this before. Does anyone remember where we would use that eddy current? So remember our eddy current we're talking about, we've got that transformer coil creating a magnetic field. We have a core sitting in that magnetic field. And therefore, uh, in spite of the fact that we don't want it to happen, uh, that magnetic field will induce some current into the uh, into the core itself, which will flow th through the core and we, we lose some of our energy like that. But there is a, a very specific case where we actually use those eddy currents to our advantage. It's nothing to do with a transformer, it's something else entirely. 
does anyone remember or um or is using the clues i've given you and you've come up with to that what do we think i know i've talked about this with maybe not everyone but at least some people in class yeah nice nathan's got an induction stove so if you weren't ever part of that conversation you can imagine a, an induction stove uh induction stove top so these are the glass stove tops that uh, the way they advertise them is that they stay cool they don't get hot and the reason is because it, the element is not a heating element like we would have on a traditional stove uh it's just a coil it's a big magnetic coil so we push a current through that coil it creates a magnetic field and we put the um pan or pot on top of that and the pan is acting as well, you could say it's acting as the secondary of the transformer, or uh, you could also say that the pan is acting as the iron core. Without the laminations, there's nothing stop stopping current from flowing through the uh, through the iron core, which in this case is the is the bottom of my pan. Uh, and then what is current going to do? Is it high current flowing inside that um, inside that pan? It's going to create heat. It's going to generate heat. And it makes our, our pans hot. It's a it's a really efficient method of uh, cooking because on any sort of traditional stovetop, I have to I've got a heating coil or heating wire inside the element, and then the um, uh, the pan sits on top of that element. And when the element gets hot, when the pan is touching it, the pan gets hot too. So there's a few things that are inefficient there. One is that if my pan is not perfectly flat or my element is not perfectly flat, then I'm going to have bits where it's not touching. So it's a surface area contact, which is going to be my primary heating source. So I have to get really flat pans and really flat elements to get good surface area contact and therefore good transmission of heat. It also means that if I don't have good surface area contact, I'm going to get hot and cold spots in my pan. With an induction, uh, induction coil, heating the heating the pan the bottom of the pan directly there's no contact required it's just that magnetism is causing a current to flow in the pan which will heat it up which means it doesn't matter if it's flat doesn't matter what the surface area of contact looks like it's the magnetism that's doing the job it also means that the pan gets hot there's no transmission of heat from a coil or from an element through to the pan so once i take the pan away the the uh, induction cooktop itself doesn't generate any heat it's only generating heat in the pan. So obviously if you cook with a pan and then you take it off, the glass of the cooktop will be hot because the hot pan was touching it. But there's no generation of heat inside the stovetop to heat up that glass. So if I turn the um, if I turn the elements on or if I leave it on, uh, it's not going to generate any heat by itself. It won't consume any electricity just sitting there either because all we'll do is put a voltage on that coil, but there's no secondary to create any current flow. So it'll just sit there and do nothing and the um, stovetop will never get hot. It's pretty neat. Uh, using the same principles as a transformer, or if you actually think about it, it's it's almost like a kind of transformer. And um, and Ray, you've raised a, a very good point there. So my... Um, Yes, my stovetop in this case is a uh, a really powerful wireless charger. But actually, when you say when you talk about a wireless recharger, the wireless phone charger, uh, that has a uh, a direct relevance to what we're talking about here. Even if we put aside the induction cooktop, um, when your wireless recharger is a transformer. So we've just learned that a transformer at its at its heart is two coils, right? Put power onto one coil, creates magnetic field, put the other coil in that magnetic field, and it induces a voltage into it. That's what your wireless recharger is. It's where your wireless charger is. So you've got that wireless charging disc. It just has a coil in it. It's got a magnetic coil in it. So I put a voltage on that. It creates a magnetic field. My phone has a coil inside. It usually runs around the outside. It's only a few turns, so it's a few few turns of very fine wire around the outside. Excuse me. I put my phone onto the wireless charger. I have a coil in the charger creating a magnetic field. I have a coil in the phone. The coil in the phone sits in that magnetic field and induces a voltage. That voltage is connected to the battery. 
battery charges. So in a very literal sense, this is not even an analogy, in a very literal sense, a wireless charger and phone is a transformer. It's a double wound transformer. That's, exact, that's exactly what it is. That's exactly how that works. Pretty neat, huh? I've heard, uh, I've heard talk that um, this will be the um, next generation of charging systems for electric cars, is that you have a coil installed in your driveway. Presumably someone comes along with a concrete cutter, cuts a channel into your driveway or garage floor or something like that, install the coil in there, run that out to a power source, and then when you park your car over the top of that coil, uh, your car will have a coil in it as well. So put a voltage onto the coil in the ground, creates a magnetic field, drive your car over that magnetic field. Uh, if your car has a coil in it as well, it becomes a transformer and you can charge your car that way. So I believe that that's the uh, the idea for the next generation of uh, electric vehicle charges is transformers basically turn your turn your charger into a transformer. Incidentally, something I've noticed about wireless rechargers, just take the cover off my phone so you can, might be able to see on the back there. I've got that little metal plate. That's that's the um, it is just it's just a little metal plate. And uh, in my car, I've got a uh, rather than a cradle to hold my phone, I've got a little magnetic thing that sticks to the window, so I can just stick my phone onto the mag onto the magnetic holder, which is pretty neat. Um, but the downside is that that no longer works on the wireless charger. Doesn't work on the wireless charger. Obviously, that little uh, metal plate is interrupting that transmission of the magnetic field. Which has always seemed logical to me, but actually now that we're talking about transformers and we're talking about iron cores and primaries and secondaries, I don't I don't actually know why having a steel plate in between my two coils would make any difference. You would think it actually would just act as a just act as a as a core. It doesn't make any sense. It's true. It's true. I can tell you that as soon as you put that steel plate on there, then the, the wireless charger doesn't work anymore. But now that I think about it, I'm not sure why. Mm. Anyway, somewhat off topic there, but there we go. <coughs> okay. So cooling, we're talking about cooling. Now, obviously, we, we talked a little bit about cooling and the single phase transformers. With the three phase transformers, it's a bit more important. Our three phase transformers are going to be our transmission transformers, right? These are the ones that we're going to see uh, out in the street. These are the ones that are carrying power, transforming the voltages up and down between the power station and our house. The, our whole power system is three phase. The only time you'll ever see single phase is at your house or at the end user. There's no single phase transmission. So all of our transformers are going to be three phase. And as I said, the, the capacity of a transformer is limited by its ability to dissipate heat. So if I can improve the heat dissipation or improve the cooling, then I can increase the capacity of that transformer. So a dry cooling, these transformers are constructed with air ducts and passages between the windings and between the windings and the core to facilitate free flow of air within the transformer. Enclosed dry type transformers have the core and windings placed in an enclosure where the ambient air circulates through the windings to cool the core. This air is then cooled by cooling fins or radiators built into the transformer enclosure. So we're just talking about these air gaps around the transformer so that air can flow around. And when it goes into the um, enclosure, then we'll have uh, cooling fins on the outside to cool the air that's inside the transformer enclosure. An oil-cooled transformer or oil-filled transformer, as I mentioned in the last topic, oil-cooled transformers are enclosed in a steel tank and oil. So it's inside a steel enclosure and filled with oil and the transformer is inside there. Uh, the advantages it has over air has a higher specific heat than air, allowing it to absorb larger quantities of heat for the same temperature rise. So uh, oil can absorb more heat than air. It has a higher heat contact has a higher heat conductivity than air. Uh, just like when you get into uh, water, right? If you go into a pool that's say 20 degrees, that'll feel cold as hell. Even though if you're standing outside in air that's 20 degrees that feels pretty warm. That's because uh, water in this case and, and oil in our example here are a better conductor of heat. 
So at a given temperature, the water will feel colder than the air because it's taking more heat away from you. Uh, yeah, so something to note about the oil and transformers. Um, not, yeah, this is one of those ones that this should never happen to you unless something has gone terribly wrong. Uh, I, I, I would say it's very unlikely that you will ever come into contact with a large transformer or the oil inside a large transformer uh, without having had some other instruction or training on those things other than what I'm telling you today. If anybody is going to ever uh, have to go and look at a large power transformer and all they know about transformers is what I've told them, then that, that poor bastard is in big trouble. <coughs> Nevertheless, please note that the oils that have historically been used in transformers, I don't believe they're used anymore, uh, but uh, they certainly have been used in the past, and I guess there's probably stuff out there. Uh, it's called uh, PCBs, and they're incredibly carcinogenic. They'll, uh, they're outrageously toxic stuff. So do not, do not, whatever you do, come in contact with the oil out of a transformer without having uh, at least had a hell of a lot more uh, knowledge and instruction than, than I'm giving you today. Right, so here's a cutaway view of a three phase oil cooled transformer. We have the oil reservoir visible at the top. That's this guy here, the little cylinder. And a radiator, radiator fins aid the dissipation of heat. So you imagine this enclosure. These are our coils here, one, two, three. Uh, they look like they'll be concentrically wound. Uh, and they're just going to be filled up with oil. So the oil just moves around through the coils freely. It's an insulating oil, so it's not going to cause any short circuits or anything like that. Uh, and then the fins on the outside of that box uh, will air cool, you know, allow the heat of the oil to dissipate out into the atmosphere. Uh, and you'll see, actually, you'll see start things that look remarkably like this. Um, hanging off the top of power poles or even uh, sitting on the side of uh, the street or something like that. <coughs> this is this is uh, pretty similar to what uh, most three phase transmission transformers look like. Oh, plain radiator cooling. In this case, the cooling takes place through the air or oil being exposed to the tank and the tubes or radiators attached to the tank of the transformer. The tubes or radiators are exposed to the air and this dissipates the heat developed in the transformer. Do we have a picture? No. Yeah, so in this case, yeah, the, the common one that you'll see here will have um, tubes coming out of the side or pipes coming out of the side of the transformer. Um, as the oil heats up, it gets pushed to the outside and flows up through those tubes. And then obviously the tubes on the outside of the transformer, the oil flows through them that has a much higher surface area of contact with the surrounding atmosphere. So it just um, cools the cools the oil like that. And then the cool oil will drop back into the uh, into the transformer and cool the uh, cool the coils again. <coughs> A forced air radiator. In this case, air or gas is pumped through the core and the windings and then through the fins or radiators attached to the transformer tank. This is an efficient method, but it relies on the air or gas continually being pumped through the transformer. Yeah, so if we're pumping a cooling medium, in this case air or gas, through the transformer, that's obviously going to be uh, significantly more efficient than just a, some sort of ambient cooling. As it says there, it relies on the um, air or gas continually being pumped. If we, if we think back to the concept that we're talking about here, that I can improve the capacity of my transformer by uh, cooling it effectively, then we also have to realize that uh, any failure of our cooling system then can potentially cause a catastrophic failure of the transformer, right? So if I had a transformer that could handle, let's say, without doing anything to it, could handle 100 amps per phase, and then after that, that's going to cause too much heat and my phases will blow. 
if I don't say I put a flash uh, cooling system on there and I can handle 150 amps per phase. So then I start running that thing at 120, 130 amps per phase and everything's fine because I continually cool it. If the cooling system breaks down, well, then it just goes back to being a 100 amp per phase transformer, right? But I'm already putting 120, 130 amps through there, so it's going to shit itself pretty quickly. So uh, that'll be one of the disadvantages of any sort of active cooling, anything where I need a, a fan or a pump to pump oil or something like that. And if that thing fails, the transformer is in um, uh, significant risk of failure uh, very, very quickly. Uh, hence, we have um, alarms and protection devices, right? So if we think about the role that, a tr that transformers in general play in our distribution system, in that uh, every single place where you can get power, you know, the lights in your house, your switchboard, sockets, and the same everywhere, they're all connected directly back to a transformer somewhere. That transformer is probably fed by a bigger transformer, which is coming from another transformer, and so on and so on, all the way back to the power station. So there, there might be, I, I actually have no idea, but untold transformers between uh, between you right now, sitting there, presumably you're looking at a computer or a phone that's plugged in somewhere, so the power that you're using right now, between you and the, uh, and the power station, there, there's uh, who knows how many transformers in that um, circuit. And if any one of those uh, goes down, then your power turns off, right? That, that's really uh, simple and obvious. So if you think about it then, every single one of those transformers is critical. If any one of them dies or goes offline, uh, people's power gets turned off. If we are cooling all of those things to increase, as I said, increase the uh, capacity of them, then as soon as the cooling system and any transformer fails, it becomes at risk of the transformer itself failing because it's now operating well above its design parameters. And uh, if it does fail, somebody's power turns off. <coughs> and if somebody's power turns off, right, it's not going to be a um, it's not going to be a simple case of turning a circuit breaker back on. If you if we've had a transformer that's melted down then uh, someone has to replace that transformer, which is going to be a fairly significant job. So hence our distribution system and our transformers specifically are likely to have uh, protection devices to make sure that they don't blow up. And then also alarm systems on there. So something connected to it to let us know, well, not me or you specifically, but whoever's supposed to look after those things to let somebody know if uh, if a condition exists within, within a transformer, that is a, that is a risk or a hazard. That makes sense, right? So we're talking about temperature protection, oil lever indication, overcurrent relay, and a buckholz relay. Uh, and if we think about it, all of those there are uh, to do with the temperature, right? It's all, it's all about the temperature of that transformer. That is the limiting factor, as we said. So the temperature protection is obvious. Oil level indication, well, obviously, if we have an oil-cooled transformer and we lose the oil, that's going to affect the temperature inside the transformer, so that's a problem. Overcurrent relay, again, our current is only limited by heat dissipation, so if we're drawing too much current, it's going to overheat it. And the Buckholz relay, I can't remember what that does. We'll see it in a second. Temperature protection. The temperature of a transformer may be measured by means of thermocouples or thermistors placed at strategic places within the transformer tank. So thermocouples and thermos is just being devices to measure the temperature. During the design of the transformer, maximum temperatures are determined and the temperature protection should be set to isolate the transformer when these temperatures are reached. Temperature sensors or alarms may be incorporated into the tank to warn of a temperature rise taking place. There's, there's probably uh, at least a couple of stages uh, in there. Um, as it says there, it'll be connected it should be connected to some sort of isolating system. So once we get over temperature, it's going to uh, disconnect that transformer, which will again probably turn somebody's power off. But that is preferable to letting it run and blowing the, the blowing the transformer up because now we've cut off somebody's power and we've also destroyed the transformer. 
However, before we get to the point where the transformer is going to shut itself down because it's reached that temperature maximum, we should have some sort of warning or alarm that's going to tell somebody that that temp that the uh, temperature in that uh, transformer is rising and it's going to cause a problem. So hopefully if it's going to shut itself down at, I don't know, 90 degrees, then maybe at, at 80 degrees it sends out a warning to someone to say, hey, the temperature in this transformer is getting a bit high. <coughs> Can you imagine that? This is another one, like we were talking about, was it street lights yesterday or the day before? This would be another one of those unseen things that's happening out in the world that we have no idea about it. Can you imagine how many transformers, even just that kind of limited view that we've got on this now, how many transformers there must be in our transmission supply system? And if every one of those had some sort of temperature warning going to somewhere, and imagine there must be a control room somewhere where, I don't know, I guess somebody's probably just sitting in front of a computer screen, but you know, I like to think of the world in, in terms of, you know, 1960s James Bond movies. So there'd be a room somewhere and there'd be a huge map on the wall with little lights that show you every every transformer in Auckland or something. And then like they'll flash on or it starts to overheat or something. There'd be a guy there with a big red phone ringing someone. You know, the, the transformer on Otara Road is overheating. You better get down there quick. I don't know. Maybe that happens. I'm not sure. Like I said, it's probably just somebody sitting in front of a computer now. Somebody probably gets a text. The the closest technician will probably get a text to say that uh, the transformer on Otara Road is sitting at 75 degrees. But still, it's still cool, right? We're still talking about this massive invisible system that kind of runs and controls our day to day life in a in a way that that we have no concept of. Never occurred to us that it ever existed, and yet. Here we are. God, you guys are boring. Uh, at least give me a thumbs up or something if I say something interesting, or maybe a thumbs down if it's terrible. <laughs> All right, let's carry on. Ah, oh, cool, got a thumbs up. Thank you. Uh, right, so indication of oil level. I am a nerd. Yes, I am a nerd. I think that's an advantage, so let's be fair here. If I wasn't a nerd, I wouldn't know any of this shit, and, now, and you wouldn't know any of it either. And I would just tell you all of the basic things that you need to know. But being a nerd is important because every now and then I come up with some weird thing that just kind of brings, hopefully ties the stuff together or, or gives some sort of uh, counterpoint to it that makes it relevant to our life. But I am a nerd. I agree with you there. All right. So at oil, oil level indication, a glass tube mounted along the side of the tank or, or conservator tank is a very simple method of indicating the level of the oil in the transformer during a visual inspection. This may be used to note the level of the oil during maintenance checks. A relay incorporating a set of contacts which are closed by a float in the oil is a very simple mechanism of raising an alarm when the oil drops below a predetermined level. Electronic level detectors using photoelectric cells may also be used to determine the level of the oil within set limits. The transformer must be isolated once the oil level has reached a predetermined level in order to protect the transformer against serious damage due to the loss of insulation as well as increase in temperature. <coughs> yeah, so so we, we know, we've seen that, uh, or at least we, we've worked out logically why it would be so important for us to un to, to uh, ensure that we, we're not losing oil out of a transformer. Other than the oil is really toxic, like I said, we don't we certainly don't want to have transformer oil leaking out everywhere. Uh, but we can clearly see that uh, loss of transformer oil will lead to overheating of transformers. Overheating of transformers causes all sorts of uh, issues on our, on our um, distribution network. Hence, we want to monitor the oil. We don't want to just monitor the temperature. We don't want to know that the oil is getting low when the transformer is already overheating. We want to know that the oil, what the oil level is, ideally at any given time. And again, this might be a little bit old. These systems might be a little bit old, but actually uh, the technology exists and it wouldn't surprise me in the slightest 
if out in the world now that there is uh, a system in place for the real mo real time monitoring of the oil level in every single transformer because all you'd need is a is a level a level gauge and a little um a telephone connection or a, or a cell phone card or something in it um, to send out signals and they could all be received in a control room and someone can look at them but anyway uh at a very simple level like this one you just have a glass tube on the side of the tank and you can physically see what the oil level is so somebody could be going and doing maintenance checks on the transformers and checking the oil level or a little contact there so so it's talking about a float so uh, con a floating contact would mean that when the oil is high enough the contact is floating up here when the oil level drops the floating contact drops until it's touching another contact which closes the switch which would turn on the alarm so a floating contact for uh for oil level in this case although this is a fairly common system for uh any type of liquid if we want a, a minimum level of a liquid then a floating contact is a is a really common uh way to do that so in that case then once that contact closes it's going to send an alarm to something but again like i say nowadays i i have strongly suspect there'd be some sort of uh, electronic level indicator and a, um, a real-time connection out to the world so anybody could just dial in and check what the transformer oil level is check what the temperature is all of that sort of stuff uh, overcurrent relays transformers are usually provided with overcurrent protection on both the primary and secondary windings these protection devices are external to the transformer and switch yards or cubicles mounted adjacent to the transformer Thermal type protection will protect the transformer against sustained overloads. My magnetic type overloads protect the transformer against high overloads occurring suddenly. So uh, both of those paragraphs actually, uh, they look to me like they're describing something that we're already very familiar with, talking about overcurrent protection that is external to this transformer, which has uh, a thermal bimetal protection and a magnetic overload protection uh what is that describing anyone yeah uh, in this case i would say it's not an mcb because it won't be miniature it'll be pretty big but really this slide uh is just describing a circuit breaker right it's really just describing a circuit breaker. So all this is saying is that our transformers probably got some sort of circuit protection on it, some sort of circuit breaker or fuse, maybe not physically on it, but it will be protected by uh, overcurrent protection. So yeah, nothing new or exciting there in spite of the way it's written to sound like it's something clever. We're just talking about a circuit breaker. Okay, Buckholz relay. A Buckholz relay is a gas and oil operated device installed in the pipework between the top of the transformer main tank and the conservator. A second relay is sometimes used for the tap changer selector chamber. The function of the relay is to detect an abnormal condition within the tank and send an alarm or trip signal. Under normal conditions, the relay is completely full of oil. Operation occurs when the floats are displaced by an accumulation of gas or a flap is moved by a surge of oil. Almost all large oil filled transformers are equipped with a Buckholz relay. First developed by Mac Buck, Max Buchholz, 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 Buchholz in 1921. Do you think that's pronounced right? It's Buchholz, Buchholz, Bush, Bush, Buchholz. I don't know. Uh, to move a picture. Oh, yeah, okay. Uh, fault conditions within a transformer produce gases such as carbon monoxide, hydrogen, and a range of hydrocarbons. A small fault produces a small volume of gas that is deliberately trapped in the gas collection chamber. A built into the relay, so there's A here, gas collection chamber. Typically, as the oil's displaced, a float, it's B, it's this guy here, float, uh, falls and a switch operates, normally to send an alarm. 
A large fault produces a large volume of gas, which drives a surge of oil towards the conservator. The surge moves a flap D. Oh, there's a flap there, that little guy there. And the relay to operate a switch and send a trip signal. A severe reduction in the oil level will also result in the float falling. Where two floats are available, these are normally arranged in two stages. Alarm A followed by trip C. There we go. So gas collection chamber, upper float, lower float, oil surge detector. Look, um, don't, don't uh, get too caught up in this one. This is a, a specialist protection device designed to be used in an oil field transformer. As I said, none of us are ever going to have anything to do with an oil field transformer unless we've had significantly more training than, uh, than we're doing right now today. And, and and like I said earlier, if you ever find yourself having to work on a oil, large oil field transformer and the only information you have is what I'm telling you now, uh, run away. You, you've, you've found yourself in the wrong job somehow. So this is a specialist piece of equipment that's used in an oil field transformer. I've never seen one. I've never heard of one uh, outside of uh, this slideshow. So I wouldn't freak out if it doesn't mean much to you. Uh, it's just not going to be relevant unless you're specifically uh, working in that industry on that equipment. OK. If you do want to learn more about the Bush Holtz, Buck Holtz relay, uh, oh, there's, some, there's a good uh, Wikipedia page about it, I think, and some videos online. You can have a look at how it operates. Uh, variable copper losses. During the design of the transformer, the resistance of the windings is kept as low as possible by making the copper windings as thick as possible and by making the windings as short as possible. Remember, as we lengthen that conductor, the resistance will increase. The losses that take place in the transformer are therefore dependent on the square of the load current flowing in the transformer. Yep, so we talked about that in depth before, I squared R. Current squared times resistance is going to be the... Uh, the heating or the, the power that I lose via heating. So it's the current squared times the resistance. And it's resistance, the actual copper resistance measured by a multimeter end to end on the coil, not the uh, not the load uh, of the magnetic field, just the copper. All right, hysteresis losses, we know about hysteresis losses. These are iron losses. This is what we're talking about, the, uh, the pan on the induction hub. Just that having a, a piece of metal sitting in that magnetic field is going to draw some current. So we will lose some current that way via um, current flowing just around and around inside the iron core. And we minimize that by chopping that iron core into small plates and insulating them against each other. Uh, efficiency, we, we covered efficiency in the last one, that's our um, output power divided by output power plus our losses, copper losses and uh, iron losses or hysteresis losses. Hysteresis, okay, that's the end of that slideshow. Oh, that was quick. Oh, it wasn't that quick. Oh, about an hour. Yeah, not too bad. Hysteresis, that sounds like hysterical. Does, um, I wonder where that, where that connects. Does anybody know what the word hysterical means or where it comes from? This is a great one. You're going to love this. No, nobody wants to guess. Nobody wants to guess or no one cares or maybe both. Well, it doesn't matter. You're trapped here with me. So uh, hysterical, yeah, yeah, something about crazy people, right? So hysterical means crazy. Like if you become hysterical, it's because you're going crazy. But hysterical is, is from the Greek word hyster, which means female. So uh, hysterical means woman-like. Now, I'm not saying that's right. I'm just saying that it's true. It's a real thing. The word hysterical means uh, woman-like. And that's where that meaning came from. People would call you, you're hysterical. You're behaving like a woman. 
and we still use that word today. Obviously, we don't have that connection or connotation with, with women, or you didn't until now, and now you do, and you will for the rest of your life. I did that to you. So we don't have that connotation of, of female, but we still use the word to mean somebody who's acting crazy. But the original meaning of it was uh, if you're hysterical, it's because you're acting like a woman. You're being uh, crazy like a woman. Isn't that atrocious? This is a sexist language that we still we still use today. I guess the sexist connection has disappeared over time, but uh, that's where it came from. Anyway. Okay, that's the end of that show and so the end of that topic and uh unless anyone has um a burning desire to keep this going i i vote that we uh we bail that's us for the week does anybody have any questions about anything we covered in this topic or earlier topic we've covered this week or anything in general do you want to know any sexist words uh any strange things that strange infrastructure things that you don't know about um, i'm here for you got someone typing no they've stopped typing okay so is that no questions then uh, well, um, think of any questions right now if you've got them. In the meantime, uh, so that's us for the week. Back at class on Monday. Hopefully, I'll be I'll be better. If not, I'll let you know. But um, of course, if I'm not over this cold by Monday, I'll just shoot myself anyway. Um, we'll do classwork on Monday so we can have practical on Tuesday and Wednesday. Remember that the tests that for the topics we've covered this week will be due on Sunday night. That does not include does not include the uh, the two transformer ones that we've done today. Those will be due next Sunday because they're next week's topics. Otherwise, you're going to have to do seven tests this week, which I'm not particularly sympathetic, but even I think that's probably too much. Uh, I feel like I had a point to make about the tests or something earlier, but I've forgotten what it was. No, must be nothing. Still got somebody typing, so we'll just we'll just follow them. Uh, they just say see you next week. Okay. Oh, if nobody's got anything else, uh, free to go. Oh, that's the thing. Actually, wait. That's what I was going to say. Now, there's one downside of me making those tests due on Sunday night. I've put it on Sunday night because I want them done before we come back to class every Monday. Just to make sure that we're all keeping up to date. Now, I, I know what's going to happen, so I'm going to warn you of this now. Is that on Sunday, maybe Sunday afternoon, maybe Sunday night, some of you are going to be sitting there going, oh, I have to do those tests now because I haven't done them. And then you're going to be, you're going to jump in there and you're going to be tempted because you're still going to start panicking and you'll be like, I don't know the answer to this question. You're going to be tempted to text me uh, message me and ask me uh, to help you. If you text me on Sunday night to ask me to help you, help you, uh, please don't be offended if I ignore your messages, because uh, just because you leave your shit to the last minute, it doesn't mean that I am obliged to uh, jump out of bed and help you. Okay, I might respond to you anyway. You never know. I do feel a little bit guilty when you guys text me and I think. Uh, I can't be asked responding, um, so I'll usually respond anyway. But if you don't get a response, then just remember, this is your fault. If you're doing your tests at 10 o'clock on a Sunday night and I'm not there to help you, that's on you. That's not on me. Don't make this about me and don't make, don't let that happen. Just get it done and then we don't have to worry about it. Everybody okay with that? Good. I'll take your silence to be assent. Good. See, so Sola, Sola knows, but he's never going to leave it till Sunday. Cool. Uh, appreciate very much. I appreciate that uh, you guys are coming to the party with me being sick this week and uh, and us being able to do this online uh, and everyone joining in and working hard. I can see that um, most of you are getting into the tests already. Uh, some of you have conf 
completed them all. Uh, so I very much appreciate that. And I will see you all back on uh, Monday. Thanks, guys.